You all can be seated. Thank you all for being here today for Lauren. She has put a lot of time and blood and sweat and tears into this, and she's ready to go. Um, we will, after she gives her speech, we're going to have a conversation for a little bit, and about the last five minutes will be devoted to her asking us questions, and so we should be done by about 5.50 for those of you who have never experienced this before. 4.50, sorry. <laughs> It's okay, I just teach math. <laughs> Sorry about that, don't panic. Okay, if you will join me in prayer. Father, thank you so much for Lauren and all of these friends and family who have gathered here to hear what she has to say today. Thank you for the truths that you've laid on her heart to share with us today. Pray that you will calm her nerves and Help us to get from this what you would have us from to take away from it. In Christ's name, amen. How long, O oh Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I take counsel in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all the day? How long must my enemies be exalted over me? Consider and answer me, O Lord my God. Silence is awkward and frustrating. At first you might have thought that I stopped because I didn't know my next line or wasn't prepared. Then maybe after a few more seconds, you realized that I was trying to make a point. Silence is uncomfortable. It often makes us doubt, worry, and squirm. But if you get away from the noise of the world, you might learn to appreciate the quiet. I believe that God remains quiet for a time because seasons of silence are essential for growth. And that God's silence is not a sign of his absence, but is actually a sign that he's working on your heart to make you more like him and prepare you for a big moment or opportunity. Have you ever had a time in your life where God just seems silent? Not necessarily during a trial, but just in your everyday life. It feels like your spiritual growth is at an all-time low. Don't deny it. If you're a follower of Christ, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Your spiritual walk probably started with a big moment where you finally saw the light and caught super on fire for the Lord. Reading, learning, and praying all the time. Then it slowed down. You didn't learn something new and exciting every time you opened your Bible. Telling you what to do or where to go next. Your instinct is probably to assume that you did something wrong. But you try other things. You buy a new devotional, join a Bible study group, and beg God to reveal himself to you. But nothing. Silence can make you feel like you've done something wrong. Like it's a punishment. And the church is often portrayed that you always have to be hearing from God and learning something. If not, then you've probably done something wrong. Silence from God is so often associated with shame. It was difficult for me to even find a book to read on this topic because no one wants to talk about spiritual silence. If they do, they only tell you how to get out of it and not how to grow and learn through it. Ask former senior pastor of Sunday Fellowship, Patrick Payton, what his thoughts were on this topic. He told me, God brings us into seasons of silence to cultivate a life of trust. He showed me a great example of this in John 15, which speaks of the vine and the vine dresser. Jesus says, I am the true vine. The Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he cuts off. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it may bear more fruit. This made me really curious, so I did some research on the wine grape and the vine. And I found something so interesting that it completely changed my perspective on silent seasons. Most people would probably assume that the most important part of a grape's life is spring or harvest or when it's pressed and corked. But no, the most important season is in fact Winter. Winter at a vineyard looks tranquil and still, but so much is happening within the vine. As the temperatures drop, the roots reach down and grow smaller roots, which suck up nutrients for winter. The most growth is happening when everything seems dormant. As a grape is being prepared for spring, things move inside that couldn't move without the season of winter. The vine cannot produce fruit if it doesn't go through this stage. 
I would argue that the same thing happens with us. God puts us in a place where we have to be quiet and alone with him so that he can press in and teach us something. And I think there's something so powerful in knowing that when God created the vine, he made it knowing full well that one day he would use it as an illustration for us. All of creation screams that silence and waiting are good and natural. It all points back to this truth, that silence is essential for growth. Where do I get this idea? Well, there's loads of examples in the Bible. In my eighth grade Old Testament class, we learned that Moses waited in the wilderness for 40 years. After he accidentally killed an Egyptian, he fled and God was silent. In the wilderness, he found a family to take him in, a wife, and a flock to shepherd. During this time, he grew and learned, and God cultivated complete trust in him through it. God isolated him, and by the time he revealed himself through the burning bush, Moses was ready to listen. The silence prepared him to lead the Israelites out of slavery. Another place where I see silence used to prepare is the 400 years between the Old and New Testament. The Jews waited 400 years for their Messiah to come and save them. 400 years desperately waiting for a word from God, a desperate need to hear from him, complete and utter dependence on him. A.W. Tozer says, he waits to be wanted. God wants us to be completely desperate for him. When we are, we will lean into his word and what he says about us. We will try to become who he wants us to be. We will wait with expectancy and anticipation. We will learn to listen. Listening sounds easy, but how do you stay focused on Jesus when it seems like he's not there? Patrick Payton suggests asking him what fruits of the spirit he's trying to grow inside of you. Like John 15 says, the vine dresser cuts off unfruitful branches and prunes fruitful ones so that they can grow. So in winter, ask God what fruits he's trying to grow in you and what branches he's trying to cut off. Because fruits of the spirit aren't just actions, they're character traits. God is more concerned with who you are than what you do. What you do is important, but for example, gentle isn't part of who you are, then you won't treat people with gentleness. And in the same way, if love is part of who you are, then you'll love people with ease. Who you are reflects what you do, so focus not just on your actions, but on your character trait. In my interview with Patrick Payton, he said, We spend most of our lives trying to do, but the Holy Spirit does its work building character on the inside. Silence is used to solidify some fruit inside of you, not as an action, but as a character trait. He gets you alone so that you have to look head on at the problem that he needs you to deal with. But focusing on potential fruit is useless if you don't stay obedient and faithful in the process. I saw a great example of how powerful obedience and silence is when I read Screw Tape Letters by C.S. Lewis. If you haven't read it, Lewis writes from the perspective of a demon writing letters to his nephew, also a demon, on how to most effectively lead humans astray. He says this about God. He wants them to learn so he takes away his hand. And if only the will to walk is really there, he's pleased even with their stumbles. Do not be deceived, Wormwood. Our cause is never more in danger than when a human, no longer desiring, but still intending to do our enemy's will, looks around upon a universe from which every trace of him has vanished, asks why he's been forsaken, and still obeys. Screwtape is explaining that humans become most effective when we don't see or hear God, but still obey him. Satan will try to convince you that silence is a sign that God has left you. He'll use it as an opportunity to implant doubts about God's goodness in your mind. But our Heavenly Father just wants to know that we'll obey Him even when we can't see or hear Him. John 15 says, Remain in me as I remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. If you do not remain in Him and in His word, then no lasting growth can happen. You will eventually escape the silence. But while you're in it, ask God what fruits He can grow in you and stay faithful and obedient in the process. Now, silence doesn't sound so terrible. So why are we afraid of it? I believe it's because we don't have control. In doing my research for my thesis, I read, He Speaks in the Silence by Diane Homer. The book tells the story of how at age 26, with three children under the age of seven, she suffered from severe hearing loss. She went to many doctors who all told her the same thing, that she was going deaf and at a rapid rate that they had never seen in someone her age. In just a few short years, she became completely deaf angry and frustrated. She was so depressed that God would not listen to her or heal her. Diane worried and feared that her children wouldn't know her or feel close to her. She couldn't listen to their anxieties and victories. Because of God's silence through her trial, she didn't feel that she could trust him with her children. Then, after a long period of spiritual silence, she realized this truth. Sometimes we just can't hear through the hollering of our own relentless worry, 
so we wonder if God's gone silent, if he's awake when we need him most. Diane understood that silence might be a result of our worry and reluctance to let go of control. She also understood that silent seasons make us doubt God's goodness, just like Jesus' disciples on the boat in Mark 4. I'm sure most of you have heard the story. Jesus was asleep in the bottom of the boat as a storm was raging outside. His followers shook him awake and questioned why he wasn't doing something, why he wouldn't save them. Jesus replied, why do you not have faith? Are you still afraid? This is what I was saying earlier, that God puts us in seasons of isolation to cultivate a life of trust. For example, when you're a child on a long road trip, you might have some idea where you're going, but you have no idea what road you'll take or how long it will take to get there. This begs the obvious question, are we there yet? I bothered my parents with this question all throughout my childhood. But as I got older, I learned to trust that my parents would get me to our destination eventually. Trust that he will eventually bring you out of the silence. Don't let it lure you to believe that you're stuck. Distrust leads to worry and fear, so we get busy to distract ourselves from our anxieties. God often becomes quiet during these times so that he can get us to listen. You have no control over these waiting periods, but you can choose to trust that he'll bring you out and to really embrace the silence. Diane Comer said, I have learned one of the surest ways to hear God is to let go of control. Your worry and restlessness might be the reason you're in the season of silence. When you stop overthinking, focus on him, and stay faithful, that is when you learn to appreciate these seasons. Now I should probably tell you why I decided on this for my little topic. At the beginning of my senior year, I met with Ms. Jackson and she asked me how my spiritual walk was going. I was really honest with her. I told her that I had been in a weird place since about June. I explained that I tried everything. I went from Bible study to small group, grasping at straws, trying to hear something from God. Eventually I just gave up, not on my faith, but on trying to hear. That's why I wanted to study this. I was desperate for an answer. As I began to research and interview people, I realized that my waiting it out method wasn't gonna work. So I just did what Patrick suggested. I started to read and pray. I shifted my perspective that I always needed to learn something new and exciting every time I opened my Bible. Instead, I tried to be steadfast in my studies and ask God what he was growing inside of me. It was hard and it took until January, but eventually I began to hear him. And it took until just recently to realize that maybe I went through this season so that I could stand before you today. And if that's the only reason I went through nine months of spiritual drought, then it was so worth it because I could not have grown without it. Silence taught me that I wasn't truly dependent on God. It made me step back, take a deep breath, and really focus on who God is and who he made me to be. Like grapes, seasons of silence are for pruning, preparing, and growing so that a new wine can be made. And that new wine is the fruit of the spirit inside of you. Silence is never without purpose, and spiritual growth cannot happen without an opportunity to sit, listen, and become completely desperate for Jesus. You might not feel growth in the moment, but when you get out, I think you'll feel better because of it. Silence is inevitable if you want to grow as a follower of Christ. So while you're in it, obey, listen, and let go of control. Understand that I'm not telling you how to get out of the silence. I want you to know that it's an opportunity to rest, become more dependent on God, and learn what fruits he's growing inside of you. So my challenge to you is to invite the silence. Understand that it's an opportunity to learn and grow. Just as the vine dresser takes care of the vine, your heavenly father will take care of you. At the beginning, I read to you a psalm when David was in spiritual silence. David learned, as will you, that God always comes through. Psalm 16, 8 through 9 says, I have set the Lord always before me. He is at my right hand. I shall not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad. My whole being rejoices. My flesh dwells secure. For you will not abandon my soul. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence, there's fullness of joy. Thank you.
we've we've learned a lot about adjustments uh, <laughs> in the last 15 minutes. Uh, so great job. Thank you. Tell me about plans for next year. I'm going to go to Baylor University and I'm going to study interior architecture. And how did you come to that conclusion? Honestly, um, the mega problem junior year in geometry, we did an architecture program and we used like AutoCAD and stuff. And so I was like, man, I could probably do this forever. So. So you're gonna. So I'm gonna. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's dive into the paper a little bit. Um, can you tell me what other situations other than our relationship with God we can experience silence in? I mean, I think in relationships a lot of times, just with each other, I think you can experience seasons of silence. Um, and sometimes it can be a bad thing, sometimes it can be a good thing. You know, when you need to like take a break from a friendship, it's like, <laughs> that's some good silence right there, but. <laughs> okay, let's, so this may come as a shock to you, maybe not, but my husband and I have a lot of silence in our house. Doesn't surprise me at all. Been married <laughs> 30 years, though. So can, can there be good in relationships with people? Like, unpack that a little bit for me. Can, can you have a good relationship with someone where there are periods of silence? Yeah, I definitely. I think when you get close enough that you can sit in silence – it's kind of like a sign of like, okay, like that's a good relationship. If you don't have to constantly be talking to each other, if you can just sit and like be with each other, whether it's a friendship or family member or relationship, like being able to sit in silence, I think is a really good thing. So why, why do you think that's okay in earthly relationships, but it stresses us out so much when it's from God? I mean, like I said in my paper, I think a lot of times it can make us feel like we've done something wrong. Because I think even, like, when you first start to introduce silence into, like, earthly relationships, I think at first your instinct is to go, did I do something wrong? At least that's my instinct. If, like, I'm sitting with a friend in a car and they're being really quiet, I'm like, okay, do I smell bad? Did I say something? So I think that's kind of our instinct. Um, and so I feel like that's our instinct whenever God is silent is to kind of assume that we did something wrong. What about in our environment? Is silence a good thing or a bad thing or just in our environment in general? I think it's a good thing. I think we don't have a lot of it these days, but, um, and it's hard for me, especially because I'm such an extrovert. Like anytime it's like quiet, I'm like, okay, I gotta go somewhere. I gotta go do something. So for me, silence is really hard. Um, but I know like my little sister, loves silence she loves to go sit in her room and be quiet and I'm jealous of that but I think it's definitely a good thing okay so this is kind of off the wall but think with me if you will okay so we've been talking about the nervous system and anatomy <laughs> um we won't share what we did today no let's not <laughs> uh but how does our body deal with the situation if there's a lot of noise going on in our environment? Be that um, a lot of touch stimulation or a lot of literal noise. Like, how do we? How does our body sort through what's important and what's not? I wasn't expecting these kind of questions. <laughs> this this last section of anatomy has been very difficult for me to grasp but I do remember talking about how um, a lot of times we get overwhelmed because our senses don't know how to kind of filter through it something about an axon <laughs> okay so what, don't give me bad participation the, so what happens what happens what is an axon tell us what an axon is oh no okay so that's where the nerve moves from the sensory part down to like where it makes you move okay 
or or if it's from our ear to our brain, it goes the other way, yes. right? And so what happens, think back to this last chapter, chapter seven. Okay. What happened when, <laughs> what happened when um, there was already a signal going up that axon? Can another one go? No, I remember that. Okay, so tell me what that has to do with being able to filter out the noise from our environment then. Okay, I see what you're doing. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think if there's too much going around you or too many voices coming in, it would be really difficult to hear, say, God, for example. It would be really hard to hear him because there's, so there's so much noise going on. You can only take in so much. So what, what are some of those noises in our environment that you think get in the way of our walk with God? Um, I think sin is a really big one. I think a lot of times that can kind of like, I don't know, put earmuffs on and or blinders on and we can't see or hear what God's trying to do because the sin is so overwhelming, um, either guilt or shame or just, um, I don't know. I think that's one of the biggest things. And then another would be, uh, if you have any kind of influences in your life that are constantly just kind of spitting opinions at you, and especially if they're not good ones, I think that can be a definite um, blockade to God's voice. Okay, thank you. Okay, since we're asking questions about stuff we talked about in class, <laughs> in advanced literature in the fall, Plato's Republic, page 45, do you remember <laughs> what we talked about? Neither do I, actually. We all know I didn't read that book. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. I, I don't remember either. <laughs> um, so <laughs> what, I, what I really want to ask you is, you know, you talked about, we just, you just mentioned um, sin and silence, and then you talked about shame. And you said in your paper that silence is associated with shame. So wha tell me what you mean by that. Why, why is silence associated with shame? Um, I think a lot of times it can be when someone's like, hey, like, how's it going? What are you learning? What are you reading about? And you're kind of like, I'm not. And it's really awkward. And you want to be able to say like, oh, I learned this awesome thing that God showed me. And especially like in small groups and in like getting coffee with people that you really respect. I think a lot of times it can be kind of like shameful to go. I'm not learning anything right now. And I think that's kind of something that's really hard to admit. Okay, so you're talking about the shame's coming from the fact that your per perception towards people and not actually s from sin that you have in your life. In that in that sentence in my paper, yes. Okay, I was gotcha. talking about how you kind of feel shame whenever you're in the silence. Why is it that that is fostered? What, why is it that, that when people ask, how's your, your spiritual life going, why is it that that isn't just a go-to or that's something that we feel comfortable even saying is, I feel like it's dry right now or I'm not hearing anything or I'm not learning anything. Why do you think that is? Um, I think it's probably just because for the most part people don't talk about it. And so you might feel like you're the only one. Um, like I said, it was like really hard for me to find a book to read on this topic because no one really talks about like spiritual silence being a good thing. Um, so I think because no one talks about it being a good thing, it's like, why would you assume if I tell them I'm in spiritual silence, they're going to be like, oh, that's great. So. So why, why do you think that is the case that like so many churches don't talk about silence, especially if that's such a common experience? Or do you think it's not a common experience in Christian and it's just your experience? I think it's definitely common, especially for new Christians. You're like on this high or like us after camp it's like a camp high and you're like oh yes Jesus everything and then like a month later a couple weeks later even a couple days later it slows down so I think it's definitely um it's definitely common I don't know I mean I bet people just don't think about it being a good thing I probably wouldn't have thought about it unless um it was brought up in my church with the whole no neutral moments series um it kind of got me thinking like okay like there, there are no neutral moments and God's always talking to me, even when it seems like it's silent and like he's there no matter what. And every moment I'm living in has some kind of eternal value. 
and purpose. So when you were doing your research on this, did you happen to come across um, what some ancient Christians called the dark night of the soul? Did you happen to come across that at all? No. Okay. So like um, what a lot of times Christians, especially a long time ago, have experienced the exact same thing that you're talking about is, you know, they, they talked about you feel the consolation of God where it's like, oh, I feel his presence, he's speaking to me, he's dying, and then the desolation, you know, and where it's like, I just feel like he's silent. He's not saying anything. And a lot of Christians had, had termed that as they called it their dark night of the soul, where they felt like God was just not speaking to them, not seeming to reveal them, not moving in their life. And so when it comes to that dark night of the soul, for you, was that a short period or a long period? Like, how long did that last for you? It was uh, June of last summer until about January. So it felt really long. <laughs> but it was was relatively short compared to, it wasn't like yeah. years that you yes. experienced this, right? Yeah. So what would you say to somebody who is in that situation where they felt like, I've been faking it for quite some time. And I've been telling people all the cool stuff, but if I'm really honest, and if we have that type of relationship that we're close enough, that I really am going through that dark night of the soul. I feel like God's been silent for years. What would be your like advice to someone like that? What, what would you say that somebody who's been dealing with this for quite some time? Um. If it's been years, I'd first probably say like, okay, what sin do you have in your life that you need to confess first and foremost? Just because if it's that long of a season, I feel like um, there's probably some bigger reason behind that. And then um, I'd probably say just don't give up on trying to hear, but like just read without ceasing and go, you know what? I didn't learn something today, but I was faithful. And I think that was the biggest like turnaround for me was when I would just get up in the morning and I'd open my Bible no matter what. And I'd open it knowing, you know what, I'm probably not going to hear something today. And that's okay. I'm just going to be obedient and do what he's asked me to do. And I think that was the biggest moment where it kind of like switched. And I was like, you know what, silence isn't so bad because I'm learning to trust him and go, okay, do I trust him enough even when I can't hear him? Um, so I would definitely suggest that. Okay, I'm going to push back on you on your first, what you've said at first. Okay. So you talked about like, you know, well, then I'd ask him about sin. I know this guy, and he was following the Lord and, and doing everything that God wanted him to do and was being faithful to God. And then his house got knocked down, and his kids were in it and died, and all his cattle were gone and everything. Do you know who I'm talking about? I do. Okay. <laughs> and his friends came along, and what did they say when he's going through one of the darkest times of his life where he's crying out to God and saying, God, what in the world is going on? Like, I, I, I've been faithful. I'm doing what you asked me to, and it's not going well. And what was their response? Do you need to confess? Yeah, like they, they said, you, got, you must have sin in your life. And so... <laughs> I'm not saying that that's not the case, that mm -hmm. some people do have sin in their life, but how, do you, how are you able to distinguish then that my silence that I'm experiencing is because my relationship with God is broken because of sin, or how do you determine, no, actually, I'm doing what I, the best that I can, but that silence is still there. H how do you determine that? Because we have a, we always are sinning, right? So what, what does that, what does that look like? Because you talked about not, God's not bringing in as punishment, but how does that sin work? And, and as far as like with the situation of Job? I mean, I would say if he's like checked himself and he knows like, okay, like there's no sin in my life that like I've confessed of everything, like I'm in right standing with God. Um, I mean, I would just say, like I said in the paragraph about being obedient even when you can't hear him about how like okay just be steadfast and I know that's something that's so hard to like hear especially when you're in it I know I hated hearing that um but I mean he wants to know that we're dependent on him and that we'll obey him even when it seems like he's not there and so just know okay like this might just be a season where I'm being tested 
and just accept that, okay, I'm being tested right now, so what are you trying to teach me through it? I really like what you said at the end of that last one that you said. It's like, you know, when you have done everything you can, you keep being faithful, even in the midst of silence, even in the midst when you can't feel like God's moving or, or in your life. I really like that answer. So I'm going to pass it on to you, but I hope I can come back because I got some more. <laughs> <laughs> you you brought up Plato's Republic and didn't even know he was talking about justice on page 45. So, I mean, he talks about the same thing the whole book. I mean. All right, so um, as you are talking about this, one of the, the things that stuck out the most to me is the idea of are we there yet, right? And so what is the role of maturity on st in the relationship of role, the relationship of that role um, when talking about this silence and the silent seasons? Could you rephrase that? Does your maturity play a role in God being silent? I mean, I would say yes in a sense, because I think as we grow, we get to a point and it's like, we've, we're always going to have more room to grow. And so it's like, okay, we'll grow up to this point. God's like, okay, I want to teach you something else. Here's a season of silence. And you learn and you grow. And then it's like, all right, here's another season of silence. So I think, I don't know if that answers your question, but I think we'll always, always immature in a sense. Like we're always having a place to grow and to learn. So I think, um, I think you'll always go through seasons of silence. I mean, until the day you die, I think you will. Okay. So did you have to reach a certain age before your dad responded when you said, are we there yet? Or it, was it like, you know, he never answered? <laughs> I mean, he, he would just, I mean, I feel like when I was little, it was kind of like almost we're almost there, you know, and then I got a little bit older and he would kind of like, I knew a little bit what time was. Cause if you tell a five year old five hours, they're going to be like, Oh, we're almost there. Like they have no concept of time. So, um, I think as he, I got older, it was like, okay, we're three towns away or we're three hours away or something like that. And then I just got to the point where it's like, we're going to get there when we get there. So I'll just stop asking. So you just gave up. <laughs> kind of. <laughs> I mean, just learn to trust yeah. that like, okay, we're not going to be in this car for a million years. We're going to eventually get out. I'm not a huge fan of road trips, so I was always right. asking that question. So that same question, did your dad ever answer the question and you didn't listen to him when he answered it and you asked him again? Yes, <laughs> definitely. I would ask and then I'd you know, be watching a movie or something and I'd ask like five minutes later, he's like, you just asked me that. So, yeah. So... In, in that, was your dad silent because you didn't hear him? Or I'm, I'm just, I guess I'm curious if sometimes we can have silent seasons because we are too immature to actually be listening well. Or is the silent season only because God chooses to be silent? a good point um I don't know I would say like in the sense that I'm referring to silent seasons it's more like you're pursuing you're trying and you want to hear desperately I think in that sense it's like okay it is almost when you're like old enough to know because it's like you're in a spot where you notice the silence because if you're so young and immature you might not notice like my 10 to 13 before I really had a relationship with the Lord I was like a Christian but those that was a, a season of silence because I wasn't learning but it's also because I wasn't trying okay so the main focus here then is for the believer seeking to hear his voice not just the believer who doesn't know how to hear yeah. right okay um this is a, a really interesting kind of compliment to the, the scripture you offer with uh, this, this lady, Diane. 
and, and so she loses the hearing and, and she desires to hear. And so my question is, I guess, in thinking of it human nature wise, if we lose a sense, our other senses start compensating. And so if we don't hear from God is part of the practice that we should be kind of engaging in, like trying to utilize our other senses to see him or feel him or, I don't know, smell or taste. I mean, it happens somehow, I'm sure, right? Just not the obvious way. So you're asking, are we, should we try to so do that? Should we try to use other senses if we can't hear God? I think it's kind of like a tendency whenever you can't, at least for me it was, to like, okay, then I'll go like make sure I'm like leading this small group every Sunday without fail. And I'll make sure that I'm like leading worship every Wednesday without fail. Um, I think that's kind of, at least for me, it was like, okay, if I can't hear God, maybe I can see him working somewhere. But I also think that has kind of a danger to it of okay, I'm just, like I said, grasping at straws, like trying to hear something instead of like just resting in like who he is and just going, okay, like what do you want to teach me about myself right now? Like what do I need to change? What do I need to grow? Um, so I think there is a danger in that, but I think it's kind of like a tendency to want to see, touch, feel him. Are there, are there any other dangers we should be looking out for as far as our tendency to try to overcome it ourselves? I think kind of like one of the first questions was, was um, not being fake with people. Like I think being vulnerable with people um, is a big step. I know that was the biggest step for me because I started in June, but I didn't really admit it to anyone until I met with Miss Jackson. And that was kind of the first step in making a change and going, okay, I can't just sit here. Like I need to actually do something. So I think a, a danger is keeping it to yourself. And so I'm um, just going, I'll fix it myself. But I think talking to someone, having accountability, Miss Jackson asked me every week, hey, how's it going? Like, are you learning? Are you praying? Are you reading? Are you being obedient? And I think that was a huge help. Thank you. <laughs> okay. I have a lot I want to ask you but I have to reserve time for Mr. Adams. So. Um, so tell us a little bit about what your senior project is this year. Um, my senior project is World History to the sophomores. Is that what you're asking? Mm -hmm. Okay, <laughs> just making sure. Yeah, I kind of grade papers and run errands for Ms. Jackson when she forgets the iPad. Never. <laughs> Never. I grade the papers and stuff like that, so. Can you think of any examples from world history where silence or maybe the opposite, if you want to, noise plays a role, an important role? Man, I only got my memory like. <laughs> Just from like our world history class and things that we've learned well, then? Or history in general. Okay. We talked about um, a lot at the beginning of the year of the history of the church and kind of going through like Renaissance, medieval, Reformation and stuff like that. And um, I think that during the Reformation, it was um, that's when the church kind of like broke off and they started leaning more on scripture. But... Um, I think because they were hearing from God a lot, so this is kind of the opposite, but like they were hearing from God so much, there were a lot of riots because people started getting big heads. Um, and so that's one thing I can think of is like, I, I don't think God was silent at all in that point. And I think people kind of took advantage of it and, you know, they burned churches and people. And um, I think that's when it was kind of like, maybe they needed a little bit of silence in that point. Okay. Um, do you think that we can be growing in one aspect of our spiritual lives while we're experiencing silence in another aspect?
I want to say yes, because um, at least for me, I was not necessarily like learning like through scripture and I didn't really like hear a voice from God telling me like what to do, but I felt that he was not silent in the sense that he gave me a lot of opportunities at the beginning of my senior year in like leadership roles and with um, just like assembly team. And I had a great RT group this year and um, more opportunities to serve in church and to sing there. And so I think he kind of like laid that in my lap and that was encouraging to know like, okay, I'm not necessarily learning something, but like he's still there and he's like giving me these opportunities, which has been really cool. So I would say yes to a degree. Okay. What about during that time when you were being faithful and obedient to be in the word? And I'll, I'll stop there for a minute. Were, were you gaining anything from that time? Like, were you, were you gaining some head knowledge when you were doing that? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I, um, I mostly read the gospels. I started in Matthew and went through, um, and it was, I went kind of in order. And so it was cool to see. So I like thought I know the story of Jesus, but every once in a while I'd see something that I'd never read before. Um, so it was, I did learn head knowledge. And then at the end of silence, it was like, when I finally realized like, oh my gosh, I just learned something the first time in like months. It was everything that I had read kind of like, certain things popped out and at the end it was like oh my gosh he's been showing me these the whole time and then at the end it was like really apparent so so what do you think the secret ingredient was there I mean I don't know if there is one I just I think the biggest thing was changing my perspective to know I don't need to I don't need to walk away from this being able to go in the kitchen and tell my mom the cool thing I learned um I could just be obedient and just say, okay, I did what you wanted me to do. And not necessarily marking something off a checklist, but just going, okay, like I was obedient today. And if like, that's all I've done, I did it, you know? Do you remember back in August when I gave you that chapter out of that book Mm -hmm. to read? Can you kind of tell everybody what that was about? And maybe that's a portion of the secret ingredient? I can remember. Um, I remember, yeah, that's what I was going to say. I remember a lot of it talked about time and about how um, it's not quite like to us what it is to God. And like he knows when he's going to show up for me. And I just have to sit and go, okay, you know what? It's not my time yet. And that's mainly what I remember from it. You probably remember a lot more because it's on your shelf. (laughs) No, that was... That's, that's a good summary. Um, okay, one last question, then I'll give it to Mr. Adams. If you, had n- if you had not chosen this topic, what would you have written about? Um, I think my second option was justice, because that's a big thing for me. Plato's Republic. No, not Plato's <laughs> Republic. <laughs> it's always been something that like I fought for, and anyone who knows me, knows that I stand up for people and I fight for people more for them than for myself, but also for myself. But, um, that was something I was going to dive into. But since this was something that was going on in my life, like right then. And like I said, in my speech, like I was desperate for an answer. So I really wanted to study this. Okay. Thank you. So Lauren, uh, so silence as would you consider that to be a spiritual discipline? I'd say so. Okay, then. I oh mean, no. <laughs> I've never been diagnosed as having ADHD. <laughs> but look, my students are laughing. Would you Would you say that I probably have some form of that? You're, you're okay, just fun, um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I make my whole job is to talk. Like whether it's teaching or preaching, like I'm all about the That's why I wanted the mic again, right? (laughs) So how does someone like me cultivate the spiritual discipline of silence? 
Like, how would I cultivate that in my life where it is not natural or normal for me? Well, I think you can't practice it until you go through it. Um, But I'm kind of in the same boat with you. I talk all the time. Everyone in my family knows that. I love to talk to people and with people. And so I was the same way. And that's why it took me forever to realize that, like, okay, this is actually a good thing. But I think when you're in it, to just sit. I know I keep repeating that, but I think that's the biggest thing is to just rest. And, um, I don't think you can practice it or cultivate it until you are in it. Um, that's what I'd say. So how, how do you, if it's a discipline, meaning you practice it regularly or often, how are you still incorporating that discipline of being silent? What does that look like for you personally? Um, the biggest thing for me is, Even like my day to day going at it with an attitude of I don't need to learn something huge and exciting. I I think that's the biggest like like mistake I made, which is good to like read like excited and I still do. But now I practice not being discouraged whenever I don't. I think that's that's the biggest thing that I kind of do day to day is like, okay, it's okay because before I get really down on myself for it. So. But you don't carve out any time in your day where you're like, I'm just going to sit silently before the Lord. I do that in my car pretty often, actually. I turn off my music um, and I just sit and be Mm -hmm. quiet, especially this week with all the nerves building up to just sit and like pray for 10 minutes and then just be quiet the rest of the way home. And it actually has helped calm me down a lot. So yeah, this week I definitely practiced that. You know, that's just this past a week or so ago. Johnny and I were sitting on Wednesday night, and a lot of it's contemplative prayer. You just sit, and you think, and stay in silence. And we talked about that. One of the things we said, it's like, it seemed refreshing. Did is that Was that your experience, too, with the just being silent before the Lord, that it felt refreshing to you ever? No. Or? It, not at first. Okay. It takes getting used to, especially for someone like me, who really likes noise. Um, but yeah, after... After a while, so I guess that is where the discipline comes in. It's just like even when it's uncomfortable to just do it anyway, and then eventually it's like, oh, it's kind of nice. So yeah, and but if I've read from what you've said, that's not why the goal always is. Oh, that it'll be refreshing, or I'll have a sense of peace. But <laughs> that's awesome when it does come. So you talked about listening, right? So in that moment of silence. You're just listening and hearing for the Holy Spirit. What what does that look like? How do I know that when I'm listening, I'm not, like, for example, George Whitfield, he thought he heard from God that his new baby boy was going to be the next evangelical preacher, right? And he dies at four. And he's like, I misheard God. Like, so how do you, when you're sitting there listening in silence, how do you know that you're hearing from the Holy Spirit and it's not Satan or it's not just my own (laughs) desires of like, I want this to happen. Like, how do you determine that? Yeah, that's really hard. But, um, I would say, and Christian talked about it in his thesis on Monday, but really just comparing it to scripture because like that is our basis of truth first and foremost. And if it doesn't line up with scripture or, um, God's character, then, you know, throw it away. Because that should be, like, our basis for everything. That's awesome. So <laughs> now I'm going to ask you a question that's hard because I'm, I'm say I'm in the same boat as you. So what about things where you've run it through the grid of Scripture and, and you haven't, like, what you seem to hear from God isn't against Scripture or against his nature? Do you know how you determine that's from God or not? And I'm not looking for an answer because I'm s- still processing that all myself, too. I think all of us are. Could you give me an example? Um, let's see here. So, like, for example, like, let's use you going to college, right? And, like, uh, what were the two main choices that you had? Baylor and A&M. Okay, Baylor and A&M. So you sitting there and you're praying and you're asking God, which one should I go to? And as you're sitting there, you obviously chose Baylor, right? So if you're sitting there in silence 
and what all of a sudden you just see this huge bear <laughs> into, your, into your mind. How do you know that like that bear that you suddenly had in your mind is God <laughs> speaking and telling you to go to Baylor and it's not just, I don't know, I'm just, I happen to see it on TV, you know, or I like Yogi Bear or something. Like, how do you, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Do you see, does that make sense? Like, how do you know when it comes to yeah. things like that? Like, you run through the grid of scripture. Like, how do you know then, how does God speak to you when it comes to things that are in, in that realm? That's tough. And I only have 18 years of experience. So <laughs> I don't That's feel like I can point. adequately answer that. But I mean... I don't know. I Do think you have an example of like where you felt like maybe like the school. How did you feel like God led you there? Like, did, did you have an example? Have you thought I, I clearly believe that when I sit in the silence and listen to God, this is what he spoke to me about. I mean, with the schools, it just kind of it was up in the air until I went and looked at both of them. And then it was like, man, I really wanted to like a and because I had a lot of people I knew going there, and I was like, that would be so convenient. But it, it was a clear voice from God saying, this is what I have planned for you. Um, so I think it didn't matter really where I went. I think God could have used me anywhere I went. So um, I think that was the biggest thing was going. I'm not making some like huge life decision where one path is going to be God's plan for me and one path isn't going to be God's plan for me because there wasn't anywhere in Scripture telling me, don't go be an Aggie. It's a cult. I mean, sorry, <laughs> my grade just went so down, <laughs> but so, yeah, I mean, I guess that is an example of that. It was just, I mean, kind of a feeling, but also knowing like, I don't think either one would have been detrimental to my walk or my faith. That's true. That's a good point. And two, sometimes like I've personally experienced sometimes outside ex circumstances help determine, oh, like, well, these people guided me this way or I have <laughs> friends here or I have contacts like sometimes God I think speaks through his people as well that helps you make a clear decision um, so that's awesome uh, I want to ask you some more but I'm going to skip the last one um, so you talked about like um, you said at the end of it you talked about this nine months of spiritual drought and that's so worth it and you said because I could not have grown without it so Tell, talk to us a little bit about how these nine months, wh what have you grown in? What have you seen God do as a result of what he led you through? Um, I think the biggest thing, which is I kind of touched on it in my speech, but um, was that it really showed me that I wasn't dependent on God, especially whenever I went through the season where I kind of gave up on trying to hear I'd put my Bible away for weeks and I wouldn't open it because I was like, what's the point? Like, I'm not going to hear anything. And then when I started studying and I met with Patrick the first time, it was like, oh my gosh, I'm not dependent on God at all. Like if I can just put away scripture for three weeks, I mean, what does that say about me as a Christ follower and someone who's leading worship every week and someone who's leading a small group of sixth graders every week? Like, how can I do that whenever I'm not even dependent on my creator? So that was the biggest thing. Well, Lauren, I just want to say that, you know, I'm super proud of you to be able to stand up here and talk about this, that, oh, my spiritual life wasn't as great as I thought, and just having that auth authenticity. And so it's been my privilege to teach you most of these four years, and I'm just excited to see what God's going to continue to do in and through you at Baylor and as you grow and in the silence. And I love that, that you said you're going to be faithful. Keep being faithful, and I just want to encourage you to keep doing that super proud of you so can i pray and end us all because i think we're out of time or do you want to say something go ahead <laughs> he's like what <laughs> in the moment <laughs> you are out of time <clears throat> lauren just in the continuation of conversation there's there's a couple minutes uh, less than what we told you you would have but <laughs> Uh, there's a couple minutes for you to ask uh, questions of us oh, yeah. to continue <laughs> the conversation. So that was not the Holy Spirit talking to you. <laughs> um, okay, my question for you all would be, uh, do you remember a time in your life when you went through spiritual silence? And uh, if so, was there anything that kind of stuck out to you that you learned through it? 
I meant to text y'all with these before so you like have a heads up, but I, you know, stress. <laughs> well, you and I have talked about this a little before. Um, I think for me, that whole concept of time, I've, I've learned through periods of silence that those times of silence were usually God uh, cementing something that he had taught me through a trial, and I just needed that time to process that and make it a part of my walk. So I would say that would be mine. I have, I have two stories. <laughs> <laughs> So one of them, you know, I was like, I was sitting on my bed. I was in college. I think I was a junior. And I was just laying in my bed trying to go to sleep in silence. And I felt like God said to me, I'm going to show you who you're going to marry this year. Obviously, I'm still single. (laughs) (laughs) So, I mean, that's one of those... um, that was one of those places where I just miscommunicated and didn't hear clearly from God in that moment. But another one that's more on a positive note, um, I, I used to go to every summer to Hawaii, and I was working with Child Evangelism Fellowship. And for the while, I was directing the um, junior high program because they didn't have one. And I put it all together that summer. And at the end, I was really butting heads with the um, director. And we just were not on the same page about where we saw the ministry going, what we saw God was going to do. And so I just remember feeling this sense of like, should I leave the ministry and go somewhere else or should I stay? And so we went up to Waianae, which is like the dry side of the island. And it's super dry compared to the rest of Hawaii. And we always had our children's camp. And so we put up a prayer tent that we would pray and that you could go in there and pray. And I was sitting there praying silently before God. What had happened like it had rained on that side of the island. It never did that. And so it was just beautiful and green and lush and as I sit in there thinking about scripture the Lord clearly brought to me this verse that talks about I will bring flowers to the desert and water where there has not been any and I was trying to think through like man what does that mean as far should I leave these kids I felt guilty you know it's like ah oh, these kids like who's gonna <coughs> disciple them and who's gonna be there if it's not me and it's just like God saying look look at this beautiful desert that's turned into like flowers and green Like, do you not think I can't take care of these kids? I don't need you to do that. So he kind of just released me to be like, yes, move on with your ministry. I've got this, and I'm going to take care of that. And I don't think I would have understood that or experienced that if I hadn't sat there silently in that tent saying, God, will you speak to me and move in my life? That's cool. Thank you. So um, as, as far as God's silence, uh, I, I think, you know, I, I'm a stellar example of what to do academically after high school uh, in that I, I kind of told God what my plans were and I, I went to school and I failed at like the things I thought I was going to be great at. And, and so kind of lost a vision for what am I even doing here? And so... Um, ended up going home and just not going back to school. And my parents were like, hey, when are you going back? Like, uh, <laughs> I kind of <laughs> decided I'm not. Um, and, and so it was just a time of understanding and I would say uh, seeing everybody else around me who, who God seemed to be showing, this is what you're supposed to do. Um, and everybody's supposed to go to college. And so... Uh, they were all doing that and they were all being successful and getting to do what they wanted. And I was living at my parents' house and not doing anything. Uh, and so it was kind of during that time. And I guess it was, uh, in my attempts to fight my way out of God's silence and give him my plan B or plan C or whatever. Uh, there, there were people in it similar to your paper that, that just came alongside and said, obedience and faithfulness like that's a valuable thing and so um instead of like hearing from god it ended up i got to kind of do life for a couple years with people that they were hearing from god and so i kind of like hey 
you're sharing things with me and I'm, I'm hearing these things. And after a couple of years, it, it was a, a time of looking back and understanding like, you know, mainly not that God was completely silent, but I was just bad at listening to, to the way he, he kind of talked uh, to me. And so it, it was valuable though in those times of understanding, Hey, God is, God can be silent. It's finding other people being faithful and being obedient and just um, understanding more fully the reward of just doing those things um, in the idea that we are on this earth, we're never going to know fully. Um, and that, that constant communication <coughs> with God is not something that's guaranteed for now, but it will be uh, later on. And so placing the value into that instead of my just daily circumstance was, was really valuable. So awesome. All right, Lauren, let's, let's pray for you and then let you celebrate. All right. God, we thank you for Lauren. Uh, we thank you for the life she adds to our school, to her class, to her family, to those around her. Um, we pray that we would listen for you that we would uh, look for you and how you're guiding our lives and uh, making yourself available to communicate with us when uh, our impatience is just yelling out, are we there yet? Um, help us to have a vision uh, for your greater plan and story. And we pray for Lauren as uh, her story is continued at Baylor and, and beyond that. Uh, that you would you would speak to her and guide her and thank you for this day thank you for this discussion in this place to have it and it's your name we pray amen, amen.